Around 80 to 90% of developers in crypto right now are EVM developers. Everyone uses the EVM right now. The biggest issue though, is it was not built with performance in mind, which is why you start seeing things like Jayendra Jol, the co-founder and CEO at Say Labs. The company behind the Say protocol, an extremely fast and high throughput layer one blockchain. And the first parallelized EVM blockchain. People that do exceptional things, they generally have something that they want to prove. Being a good founder requires much more grit, being relentless, being very creative. It requires a fundamentally different skill set. How did you get so fascinated by the world of cryptocurrencies? <laughs> Yeah, that is quite the story. 2017, I was a junior in college at the time. Facebook would give new grads 100K signing bonuses. Some of them literally took that 100K signing bonus and they just put that entirely into Ether. <laughs> They're like, shit, 100K, let's just buy some ETH. Now that Vitalik Buterin has a girlfriend, it's actually bearish for ETH. We don't yeah. agree with that. Maybe this is the hot take, but I think investing in founders that are in stable, committed relationships is a positive green flag. If someone's able to maintain a stable relationship, that can potentially translate over in other aspects as well. You had an early life crisis six years ago when you lost your dad. You said that made me think a lot about fulfillment and happiness. Yeah, I feel like I was kind of taking my family, my loved ones for granted before. Kind of this mindset that like, oh, they're always going to be here. I'd never really gone through that life event where it's like snap a finger, everything completely changes. And it was... So you launched Say Labs and yeah. the protocol was Say Protocol. What is Say V2? Yeah, so when we got started with Say... 75% of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you like this show and think it provides value to you in your crypto investing journey, can you please, please, please do me a favor and subscribe to this channel? Hit the like button and leave a comment below. It helps this channel more than you can imagine. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests, and the better the conversation. Thank you. Today's conversation is supported by... Jupiter, the most used decentralized exchange in crypto and the largest DEX by volume on Solana. Mantle, a leading Ethereum layer 2 with more than $2 billion in total value locked and $3 billion in liquid treasury. So we're drinking this um, Le Piane Boca from 2018, kindly provided by our partners, Divin. And I'm gonna do something really cool here. So we open this bottle. Obviously, we're not drinking wine because we're alcoholics, right? <laughs> Point, you see, successfully opened. And now I'm going to share that with you. Share QR code, get QR code, and you should be able. <laughs> so, what do I do? I scan it. Oh, 12 tokens. The idea is when you open the digital cork, you share this with your friend and you share the data to mm. the winemakers yeah and in exchange you receive some tokens it's awesome yeah i see 12 tokens mentioned over there it's awesome <laughs> maybe it's gonna be a thousand bucks per token <laughs> <laughs> and fingers crossed fingers crossed worth it co coming to this podcast <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for doing this man of course thanks for having me on how's your day it's been a busy day uh i mean i feel like as a founder every day is chaotic in its own way but yeah i'm excited to be here as a founder, it makes me think about something I I wrote actually for this uh, for this uh, podcast, which is the other day you retweeted a chart mm -hmm. um, that is called the perks of being a founder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you want to explain what this chart shows? Yeah, yeah. I just thought it was pretty amusing because it showed like a pie chart yeah. where it's like, oh, do you remember the different things? It's like happiness, like... So like, basically it's uh, free time, low yeah. stress and great salary. Yeah, free time, low stress, uh, great salary. And then as a founder, it's basically a pie chart where it's like color coded. And as a founder, you get none of those. So they just showed three different colors all together. And when I saw that, I was just like, wow, that is so, so relatable because as a founder, you're always going through so much different shit. And a lot of it is just like, it's just, yeah, it's something you have to put off with in a way. Why would anyone start a company? when it comes with the incredibly high level of stress, a low salary and zero free time. It's fun. I think it's the most fun that I've ever had. So I can't <laughs> complain too much. Do you want to develop on that? It's the most fun that I ever had. Yeah, yeah. So back in 20, so I guess history from my side. So um, I was working at Robinhood after I graduated from college. So this was starting 2018. Um, 2019, my dad passed away. So I was like, okay, I mean, that is obviously like a pretty big life event, especially when you're younger. And it's like, okay, that, that kind of makes you recalibrate your life a little bit. Um, and one of the things that I really started to reflect on was like, what is 
the thing that like brings me happiness and fulfillment. Um, and I went through this entire thing where like I tried looking through hobbies. I tried going through um, different things like reading, for example, playing poker, playing chess, like all, all these different things. And at the end of it, I was just like, okay, the thing that really brings me fulfillment is like building cool shit and like watching it actually like start getting traction in a way. How did you realize that yeah. without starting a company? Yeah, I mean, I guess from for most of my life, I've just been like building stuff in different ways. Like growing up in the Bay Area, you're always exposed to the idea of a startup. And as a software engineer, you're also building things, seeing kind of whatever you build start getting um, traction and like people using it. So that was like really a where I'm like, okay, I want to try doing this thing that seems really exciting. And that ended up being a fantastic decision in hindsight. Uh, obviously very chaotic, but I do think that it ended up being just a ton of fun overall. There's so many things to unpack here. So let's start with the basics. Who are you? <laughs> yeah, so for the listeners, my name is Jay. I'm a co-founder over at Stay Labs. And yeah, I mean, uh, I guess in terms of my life, grew up in the Bay Area, um, studied computer science, worked at Robinhood afterwards, and then eventually ended up starting Stay. What is your mission? Our mission right now is to scale the EVM. So basically- What does that, what does that mean if you have to explain this to your mother? Mm. Yeah. So I've actually tried explaining it to my mother. It turns out that <laughs> blockchains are pretty uh, complicated concepts to explain, but at a high level for any listeners, um, the Ethereum virtual machine is what's used to process most transactions right now. Um, so if you look at Ethereum, many other blockchains, it's making use of the Ethereum virtual machine to process transactions. And um, let's say I want to send you five Ether, for example. Um, the VM is what's used to process that transaction. So it's like the base building block for like how execution works. And it's like critical for any blockchain. Now, if you look at Ethereum, it was this first, it was essentially the first blockchain to come up with the idea of a general purpose virtual machine. Um, and that was huge at the time. Like when they came up with that, no one really had this concept of a Turing complete virtual machine. Um, when they got started, I don't even think they knew for sure that it was going to be working. Like if you look at the old history of like Ethereum, it's like Vitalik's going to all these people being like, yo, does this make sense? And no one really had a refutation against it. So they're like, okay, uh, theoretically this makes sense. So let's go and build it. So when Ethereum first got built, it was built with a lot of different things in mind. Like performance was definitely not one of them. They really just wanted to get to a point where they had a functional virtual machine that people were able to make use of. I think they were also running out of money back in the day because as you can imagine with any young startup, um, it's pretty tough to make ends meet, especially as the team starts to grow. Mm. So Ethereum was not built with performance in mind, and it has now grown to be much, much bigger um, than what would I think than what any of them had originally imagined. Like the EVM is the canonical place where people submit transactions, um, both in Ethereum and in other blockchains as well. Now, most developers right now are also making use of the Ethereum virtual machine. So if you look at kind of development stats, around 80 to 90% of developers in crypto right now are EVM developers. So like basically everyone uses the EVM right now. Um, the biggest issue though, is it was not built with performance in mind. Like when Vitalik first got started, they were thinking about performance, but that was like going to be a long-term thing that they would have to deal with. And I don't think they've ever adequately dealt with that, um, which is why you start seeing things like uh, for example, submitting a transaction might cost a hundred dollars, like hundred Gwei gas fees. Stuff like that is just making Ethereum completely inaccessible to normal people. Um, and that was the inspiration for us. Like we saw that the EVM is here to stay. It's incredibly difficult to move away from a virtual machine once it's been able to get that kind of traction. Um, and we saw that this was a massive limitation of the EVM. And that's why we started building Save 2 which is the first paralyzed EVM. And that allows us to basically solve the fundamental issues around the EVM of having a uh, pretty poor performance. So if, before we do, dive deeper into that, I have a bunch of like more kind of more general questions about your background. So I had the uh, Kiao Wang from Alliance DAO mm -hmm. about two weeks ago, mm -hmm. sat at the same, in the same chair as you. Oh, wow. And he said that there are two main traits that he looks for when investing in world-class crypto founders. Mm -hmm. The first one is a high degree of autism, which, <laughs> help, which helps you think inter independently. Mm -hmm. The second one is a big chip on the shoulder mm. or childhood trauma that makes you work your ass off because you have something to prove to the world. Yeah. 
he we were kind of lo- laughing, but actually at the end he was just saying, "That's what I do. I look for founders with high degree of autism and uh, a big chip on the shoulder." Yeah. As a crypto founder doing pretty well, would you say that you share one or both of these traits? Uh, I'll let other people comment on the autism, but I fundamentally do agree with that premise um, on both sides of it. So I think with any startup, you can't have someone that is like mid curved. Um, you need to be either left curve or right curve in a way. I think typically founders in traditional Web2 companies are very like right curve focused. But I think crypto is because there's such a strong community aspect of it, which you might not see with other industries like, let's say, SaaS companies, for example. Um, I do think that left curve founders can actually do quite well in crypto. And like you've seen that with a lot of meme coins where it really is just about the community more so than like the hardcore tech behind it. Um, sorry, were you going to say do something? you think... That the left curve founders are actually left curve or they're actually very right curve, but they understand the left, <laughs> left curveness of they're the They're probably very right probably. curve. Yeah. I think if you go a level deeper, it's not just pure left curve. It's like left curve in certain things, but right curve um, yeah. for the most part. So I, I do think that you cannot be like mid curve. Like that's just not going to work, especially in crypto. Um, and then the second part of it around having a chip on your shoulder. I think that's universally true for founders. Like people that do exceptional things, I think they generally have something that they want to prove either to themselves or to the world. And if you've just been someone who's like succeeded your entire life, I think it's pretty difficult to be a successful founder in some ways, because I mean, first of all, just statistically, like the number of people that make it, like most people that end up doing really well, they haven't gone to like top schools, or like had top backgrounds, whatever, um, because it requires a fundamentally different skill set from like what it takes to like succeed in like the traditional sense. Traditional sense, it's like doing well at school. So like getting good grades, getting good jobs, um, whereas being a good founder requires much more grit, being relentless and like being very creative. So it's like completely different skill sets. How did you do um, at school? Uh, I did pretty well in school. Um, but I think I kind of viewed like high school as a failure in a way. Um, because I got rejected from basically every college I went to. So it doesn't matter how well you do. If like the purpose of all these tests is to get into a good college, even if you got like really good test scores, if you don't get into a good college, like relative to like what your expectations were then you kind of just view that as like a failure. What did you, what happened to you? What were your expectations? Yeah, I mean, my expectations were like, at the very least, like going to like UC Berkeley. Um, and that's not how things ended up materializing for me at least. Um, and I think that ended up just resulting, like as soon as I even went to college, I had like this desire to like kind of prove myself. And I think that once that, if you spend like several years having like something ingrained into you, it's really hard to take that away. So I think that in my case, like that, Interestingly, it ended up being a pretty good thing because I think if I had ended up going to a top college, I might never have built up that like desire to prove myself. Um, and I probably would be in a very different spot. Why do you think they all rejected you? Uh, I think college is a game. And I didn't think that I, in, in hindsight, I didn't really understand that game. Like there's very specific things that you can do to like position yourself well, kind of stories that you can tell around yourself. Um, and that's not the game that I was playing. Like the game that I was playing was a much different game where it's like, oh, do well in school, like get good test grades and shit. And that really doesn't matter for like, once you go to like a certain level of college, like that's not what makes or breaks your application. It's the same as working for a company, right? Especially big ones, the in politics, a, you need to yeah. understand what game you're playing. Right. And it's not necessarily, am I doing the best for my company's future? Mm. It's kind of more tricky than that is do I understand the system I'm in and is a very like selfish game. Right? It's like the I opposite just, of talking about founders. The yeah, other no, day dude. there was Paul Graham, right? Who wrote this article, founder, founder, founder mode, mode, right? Yeah. It's exactly that, right? Is founder mode versus kind of manager, manager mode. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a completely different game. I strongly agree with that. Like when I was at Robinhood, I saw that for kind of firsthand. And I think in general, like when you're at a bigger company, there's a very different type of thing that you want to be focusing on. Like, it's all about performance reviews and like the kind of story that gets told around you during performance reviews. So if there's like one high impact thing you can do and like 20 low impact things that you could also do in the same time, like that one high impact thing matters and you should do that. And the 20 low impact things, even if they matter a lot from the customer perspective because they help solve bugs that otherwise lead to friction, they don't matter as much. So there's a lot less upside in spending your time doing them. And I think at Robinhood, it was less pronounced because it was still a smaller company. But as you go bigger and bigger at companies like Google, for example, um, it does become much, much more political. 
Um, and yeah, I think it's a fundamentally different game that you need to be playing. But I, I do think in many things in life, it's about the story. Like it's around the way that people perceive whatever the kind of thing that you're doing is. I think that's true when you're in school applying for colleges. I think that's true when you're applying for a job. I think even as like a crypto founder, like Absolutely. the story around a project is like pretty critical. Absolutely. I was, uh, oh, so many examples of that, but like one of them is, um, I introduced, uh, a Meow from Jupiter mm -hmm. to Raul Pal. Mm -hmm. And then we had like a two hours conversation and the main question, the two hours started just with one question from Raul, which was, Hey, Meow, how do you keep a token value through time? Mm. And the answer of Meow was basically, we're running Jupiter, we're profitable, we can pay salary, et cetera, but this is just a small part of the value. All the rest is a premium of attention. Mm. Same thing. Like, yeah. No, I mean, I definitely agree with like token valuations right now. I mean, I, I can't comment on anything tied to like say, but I, I do think that in general, token valuations are very highly tied to the narrative around the project right now, more so than like some kind of fundamentals. I think that the industry overall will converge on different types of fundamentals in the next five to 10 years. Um, but right now there very much is a premium just on the story. And I think that's extremely inefficient. Um, it's been like 10 years. We've been saying like, he's going <laughs> to move towards something that's that is true. more kind of value driven. Yeah. I, I think it, it gets almost worse every cycle. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. true. Maybe, maybe crypto assets are just a completely different type of asset that can't be valued the same way as traditional companies. Um, my hunch is that in the longer term, that'll not necessarily be the case, but I think if it's already been Lindy for like 10 years, then it'll probably take a much longer time to change, mm -hmm. like to kind of go away from that, um, method of like having these inflated valuations for, uh, I guess, based off the narrative. I mean, there's a counter argument to that, which is it's all internet based, right? Internet, mm -hmm. uh, the most scarce resource is your attention. Mm -hmm. Therefore with tokens, you can kind of financialize at attention. So the protocols that have the most attention have the most value, which is why a meme coin could be very valuable because making people laugh or have fun is a sort of utility. I can, right? I, I mean, can see the rationale behind that argument. I think that's definitely true for the short term. I question if that attention is something that can lead to a long-term valuation that is justified. Mm. Um, but yeah. You told me I was constantly being rejected when growing up. Do you have examples of that? Except the school one. Yeah. I mean, I feel like there's the social side of fit along like friendships, having difficulty making friends. Um, like I came to the United States when I was four. And at that time, I didn't really know how to speak English. So my, I think especially like early in elementary school, it was like difficult to connect with people and to make friends. And I think especially those experiences you have at a young age, I think they end up really um, kind of changing the way that you think about things as you get older. So I think that was like one instance of like rejection. Um, I think from there, it like change into like different types of rejection, which might be like with girls or it might be with like um, student orgs or whatever, like, um, so stuff like that. And I think that after a while you kind of just become used to it in a way, um, you start developing thicker skin around it and then it becomes in a way just much less scary, which I, I think is one of the reasons why it's easier to be a founder as well. If you're used to rejection. So who is that girl who broke your heart and, uh, is the reason why <laughs> you're doing well today? <laughs> no, I, or these girls, <laughs> these girls. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's probably multiple people. Um, but I, I do think that like just going through all that does matter a lot. And if you're someone that hasn't really faced rejection before, I think it's tough to be a founder because that's just like the default, uh, mode of operation. But who doesn't go through many rejections? That's true. I mean, I think that at an individual level, it might feel like other people kind of have it all figured out yeah. and they might be having all the success and it might be like, you're comparing yourself to them and it might feel like, yeah, they have it very easy. Um, but you're right. Perhaps they are going through a very similar struggle and you don't really just see that. Absolutely. I was just, uh, talking to Mike Novogratz before, and we talked mm -hmm. exactly about life, right? Like, okay, you were a multi-billionaire, but, uh, and he was saying the same thing. Um, everybody compares themselves to other people. It's never enough. You're never really happy. Everybody has a easy life except me, et cetera, et cetera. So everybody seems to feel that way, right? Mm -hmm. 
how did being constantly rejected impact your hunger for achieving more in life? Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably, and this is starting to feel a little bit like a therapy session as well, which is pretty cool because <laughs> I, I, I only <laughs> recently, we do here. <laughs> yeah, I only recently started therapy and I think it's been kind of interesting, interesting to go through that and like dissecting my feelings around a lot of different things. But I think that if you go through a lot of rejections earlier in life, um, that makes you want to potentially achieve more to fill some kind of hole in your heart. Um, and I think that's probably something, one of the things that has pushed me to like continue succeeding, like those initial formative experiences. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely do think that having those chips on your shoulders, like if you continue having something to prove to either yourself or to the world, that's what's going to keep you going after a certain point. Like after a certain point, you've probably made enough money, at least on paper where it's like, okay, things are at a good spot. Mm -hmm. And like keeping that, like having that fire in your heart to like keep going, I think there needs to be a very strong reason to do that. Um, and I think for a lot of people, it does end up being that chip on their shoulder. That's like what continues motivating them to like, uh, just keep going at it and continue to work day over day. This is the same conversation conversation as I had with Mike before. <laughs> I should uh, chat with Mike then. I feel like we <laughs> absolutely probably have a lot of similar thoughts. Um, I had a good one, but I forgot. Um, what's the most interesting you've learned so far in therapy? It's only been two sessions so far. Mm. Um, but I think just this, even this process, like I'm generally a big proponent of coming up with processes, to, like think about how, um, I mean, just processes for like just thinking in general. And I think this process of like, okay, there's this surface level feeling that I'm, that I experienced, like this event happened. I was experiencing this feeling like what up, what led up to that event? Why did I start experiencing these emotions? And like just going a level deeper. Um, I think that's extremely helpful to like truly understand like why you feel things versus just having like these surface level thoughts that you then kind of brush away. Um, and yeah, I mean, in general, I'm just very, very bullish on like trying to dissect things. Like even at like more of like a work level or like, I guess different levels, like dissecting things to like get to the root of like what it is that you're actually trying to do or like what it is that you're actually feeling. Cause I think that lets you like make the most progress versus just building on top of these abstractions in a way that are like hiding what the true nature of things are. Where did you start now? Um, so this is actually couples therapy. Um, so. Okay. I have to say something. Sorry. I don't want to cut you with, I did the uh, last three days ago, I was in San Francisco. I did the uh, Jesse Polak from base. Mm -hmm. We started the podcast for 15 minutes. We talk about co his couple therapy. Oh, wow. Literally. Yeah. He started early on in the couple mm -hmm. and he explains why. So I want to know <laughs> more about yeah. your couple therapy experience. Yeah. So, I mean, in our case, we just moved in together and I felt like it would be good um, just from a preventative standpoint to start doing couples therapy. Um, I mean, so I'm a huge fan of like doing preventative stuff for my physical health. And I think for my mental slash emotional health, it makes sense as well. Um, in the future, I'll probably start doing like individual therapy as well. But I think in this case, just we moved in together. I think that was a big step. So we wanted to start like having couples therapy to like, like whenever there's like any small argument that comes up, it allows us to really dissect that and like prevent issues from becoming bigger um, as relationship progresses. Makes a lot of sense actually. I even hear the, the case of some people who started couple therapy in the very beginning of their relationship. Mm. They're like, oh, we failed multiple relationships before. That's smart. Let's just start with couple therapy <laughs> right away, right? If you think about it, most of the time, I mean, you can have like mismatching values or lifestyle, et cetera, but most of the time it's going to be communication problems, right? Mm. If you are preventative like that, much less likely you have issues. I strongly agree. find out much faster if it's the right person or not. Yeah. I mean, I think the way that I was approaching issues in the relationship before was to just kind of like brush them aside. Mm. And I think it's like an impatient founder. That's like maybe a pretty bad, bad habit that I developed where it's like, okay, there's these like big problems that are happening tied to the business or tied to life, whatever I'm going to deal with them. But then if there's something that's like a small problem or a medium problem, I'm just going to brush that aside and like kick the can down the road. Um, I think in some ways, like if you're a founder, I think from a business perspective, that's like great. But like in terms of a relationship, I don't think that's the right approach to be taking. Um, because those issues, they'll start eventually becoming bigger issues. And I think it's, as you said, good to just start dealing with them at the start. You had an early life crisis. You got, you mentioned it before, right? Six years ago when you lost your dad mm -hmm. and you said that made me think a lot about fulfillment and happiness. What was happiness and fulfillment to Jay before this very challenging life experience? 
Yeah, I mean, that's not really even something that I had considered before. And that kind of made me go through this. Like, I was kind of taking my family, my loved ones for granted before. Mm. Uh, kind of this mindset that like, oh, they're always going to be here. And I'd never really gone through that kind of like, that kind of like a life event where it's like, just like snap a finger, everything completely changes. Um, and it was, it definitely forced me to be much more reflective on like how I had been living my life. Um, I think that, I mean, moving forward from that, I was like, okay, I'm going to start valuing my personal relationships a lot more and take them, instead of like taking them for granted, I should be much more thoughtful about them. And that doesn't mean that like you have to be investing 100% of your time into family and like relationships. Um, but I do think you should be at least making sure that you're okay with the amount of time that you're like spending with your family, for example. Um, so that if something were to happen, like you don't have any regrets. Um, and I, I'm very thankful that like in my dad's case, there were like no regrets that I had. So I, I actually feel like um, in that case, it was probably the best scenario that it could have been given the, given the circumstances. Or I guess it would have been a lot worse if we'd had like a big, big fight right before we like passed away or something. Um, but yeah, like that really made me take much more of a mindset of, okay, be methodical about relationships and friendships. Um, and also make sure that like you leave things on a good note with everyone that you care about. Because otherwise, I mean, life is completely unpredictable. How much are you able to keep these good sort of values or principles through time, right? Because mm -hmm. when something happens, usually you're like, okay, now I'm going to change, right? But then mm -hmm. life goes on and you kind of, I want to say forget, but yeah. you, know, you have your life priorities and everything. And it's maybe a couple of years down the line, you might be like, okay, I'm kind of like the same as before. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I've actually gone through both sides of that, like things where I didn't change and then things where I did change. Um, in, in terms of things where I did change, it was tied to like being more, I guess, as I mentioned, like thoughtful about spending time with my family. Um, and I think that just, it was tied to a fundamental shift in my, in my mindset. And I think there was nothing that like really refuted that. Um, so I was able to continue going down that route. And I, I think once you've been doing something for five years, like uh, you don't really change that much around it. Um, the, the second side of that was like, I used to kind of derive a lot of meaning um, from work before. Um, and I think that's kind of like growing up in the Bay Area, like you tend to live a very one dimensional life where it typically ends up being tied to like academics and then work after you um, graduate from college. So that's what I, I was ascribing a lot of value to before. And that like actually made me reflect like, is this what I want to be like getting value from? Um, and as I was, I guess, mentioning before, I was like, okay, maybe I can find value from hobbies because like I noticed that there's like this initial period, like when you start a new hobby, like you start progressing quite a bit. And like that initial part where like you become better than like most of the world, if you just spend a little bit of time on that thing, like that's really fun. And I'm like, okay, maybe that's what's going to bring me fulfillment. And I'll just be able to like work on different hobbies and like get better at them incrementally. Um, turns out that wasn't the case for me. Like I still had this like feeling of like not really being able to make an impact, um, especially during my later tenure at Robin Hood. So I was like, okay, I think it actually is work. Like the thing that I have been spending, deriving value from for most of my life, maybe I think that actually is what is driving value, like will continue helping me feel fulfillment. Um, and I think in that case, I like kind of went back and forth around that. But I, I do think that forcing yourself to reflect and then coming to a final decision um, is much better from like coming out of one of these big life events. Are you happy today? I am, yeah. Why? I think that the stuff that I'm working on right now is, it feels fulfilling. It feels like I'm working towards something bigger. And I think that's like one of the most important things for me. Um, day to day, there's tons of friction. Like there's maybe if a hundred things happen, there's like five things that happen that are like good things. 95 things that are like just things that need to be, that I would like to avoid. Um, but I think overall, as long as there's like a North star that I'm going towards, um, it makes it, yeah, I just feel much better about like what I'm working on. You're only 28 years old, right? Yeah. I turned 28 a couple of weeks ago. Now I feel like a boomer. <laughs> it's not the first time. I'm wondering what am I doing with my life already? <laughs> Happens often. There are many youngsters of I can say our age because we're not that far apart mm -hmm. uh, or even a bit younger, right? Who might be struggling with their own happiness and fulfillment. What's some element of answers 
that you can give to a guy or a gal in their mid twenties who are looking for happiness? Where do I start? Mm. Yeah, I think that there's going to be a different answer for everyone. I think the first step is to start exploring. And like, even if you haven't even considered this question before, um, I don't think you're going to have an answer. So I think you really need to look at the different parts of your life and like what brings you longer term fulfillment. Um, I definitely don't think things that like lead to short term gratification are going to be things that like will lead to long term happiness. Um, like one of the ideas I was toying with is like, okay, what if you just adopt a very hedonistic lifestyle? Where you're mm. just like really optimizing for the short term. Um, I don't, I think some Are people. You tried? No, I, I didn't really <laughs> try that much, but <laughs> um, like, yeah, it, it, like just taking this to an extreme, like if you just like start taking drugs all the time, like in short term, that'll make you very happy. I imagine in the long term, that's not going to lead to a fulfilling lifestyle. So I do think that you probably will want to be thoughtful about like what really moves the needle for you. And I think for different people, it could be work. For other people, it might be like, relationships and family for other people it might be like certain hobbies that like they really derive this meaning from and for other people it might be some vertical that i haven't even thought about um but i, I definitely do think just the first step is to like start exploring in the industry with bitcoin right a lot of time preference delayed, delayed gratification mm, yeah. same concept you worked at robin hood before mm -hmm. building say protocol and say labs what did you learn there that you could not have learned anywhere else Hmm. Yeah, that's not something that I've reflected on before. Now is the time. <laughs> yeah. So the thing that I liked, I would say, the most about working at Robinhood was... Well, I mean, I, I think it's going to end up being like the people that I end up working with. Um, in terms of the more specific, tangible things that like I learned, um, yeah, I mean, it would be tied to like scaling these systems that are like growing really, really quickly. And I think at any given time, there's not really that many companies where you can solve these really hard technical problems. Um, because at any given time, there's only like a handful of companies that are really experiencing that like 10, 100 X growth that you see at companies like Robinhood. Um, so one thing that I have noticed is that if you really want to like make a strong career in Silicon Valley, um, getting in early to one of these places like Robinhood or like Uber or like Airbnb, um, that is critical for really seeing that growth happen. Um, and that's, if, if you're just like spending your entire career working at like one place where there's not that much like change happening, then like the amount of things you learn is like very small. Whereas if like every single month, there's like a new set of like really, really beefy problems for you to deal with. I think your growth curve just ends up being much more exponential. So like back in 2017, when I like had interviewed at Robin Hood, um, that was kind of my decision making where it's like, this is probably where I'm going to end up learning the most. Because at that time I was considering going back and staying like basically staying at school for a fifth year to get a master's degree. Or it was like this job offer that I had from Robin Hood. And in hindsight, that was like a fantastic direction to go down. Because I think I just got exposed to a lot more stuff than I would have back in back in college. Were you still working there? Uh during the meme stock craze? Oh man, yeah, yeah. Can you tell me a bit more about like how it felt like if I was a fly on the wall? Mm. Doing this, uh, yeah, that was, that was an incredibly chaotic time in my <laughs> life. Um, I think, so there's like the more engineering focus stuff. So I was like an engineering lead back then. And there's like the engineering focus side of this where it's like, it was actually pretty cool. Cause there were a bunch of like a huge amounts of traffic that we're seeing. We needed to like deal with that and like handle all this technical complexity and technical load. Um, but then the other part of that was more just like the entire way that it was handled from like a customer trust side. Um, so I guess for any listeners that might not remember, like there was a set of like a dozen stocks that were like the meme stocks back in the day. It was like, uh, GameStop, AMC, um, and like some other stocks and mm -hmm. all these stocks were just like retail was really buying into them. And these stocks were ripping straight to the moon. Like the price action on these was insane. Like it's kind of similar to like what you see with some meme points, except these were like legit stocks that people were trading. <laughs> um, and then there were a bunch of like institutions that started shorting these stocks. Because they were, I mean, they were like, this isn't rooted in fundamentals anymore, which candidly probably wasn't at that time. They're like, we're going to short this because we think the price is going to go down. Um, and then people just kept buying it more and more. And whenever there's like a bunch of shorts, whenever there's a bunch of short interest and the price keeps going up, it eventually leads to a short squeeze where the people that have these short positions, they need to close their short position and closing a short position requires buying that asset. Um, and that just creates more upward price action. So there's a short squeeze that happened. And then 
everything was just like, it was just complete mania. And then just one day out of the blue, Robin had turned off buys. And that is just do so- Do you know why? Like, do you know? Yeah, I mean, I think it was done for <laughs> legitimate reasons. I don't think it was because they were like trying to screw over the customer in hindsight. Um, it was done because they had like these capital requirements with these, uh, I guess, institutions that when there's more short, like when there's more volatility on a stock, the capital requirements you need increases. So they were like, okay, we can't meet these capital requirements if people keep buying these stocks. So we're going to decrease the amount of the assets that we have, or at least not prevent them from growing. Um, the normal retail customer is not going to understand these nuances. Like the normal retail customer is like, I want to buy stock. Stock is not, cannot be bought. So it, it was just infuriating to people. And like, as an insider, like we didn't understand, like as an engineer, I had no idea what the nuances around this were. The communication lines from like Lad and Beiju to the rest of the company were like non-existent. Like we found out about things at the same time that they came out in the press. But we were also like, all my friends were messaging me like, yo man, what the hell is happening inside? And it just makes you feel so freaking powerless when like mm -hmm. you are kind of the face for this for a lot of your friends. Like it's your reputation on the line. It's like you that people are hitting up and you have to basically justify what Robin Hood's doing without really even knowing what's actually happening. Um, and yeah, man, that's, that's shit. So that made me, I mean, much more bearish on like whenever there's like two dudes, two dudes in a room that are like calling the shots, like that's not a good model to be having. Ideally, if you are giving people your money, you want it to be like trustless and you want it to be verifiable. Like you shouldn't be trusting two dudes. You should be able to like look at everything yourself and be like, yeah, this checks out. Um, and that's when I became much more bullish on just like having systems where like you don't have like just two dudes calling the shots. What's your relationship with Vlad, the co-founder of Robinhood today? And I'm asking that because you're the founder of a pretty substantial crypto protocol. And now Robinhood is actually coming pretty big into crypto, right? Yeah. So do they just like go out and reach out to people in previous employees, alumni in the space or what's the... Yeah, I mean, I don't have an antagonistic relationship with the Robinhood team at all. I'm still holding a good amount of my Robinhood stock as well. So I think that I want to see them do well. I think that the way that they handled that was mishandled to a large extent. Um, I think the communications around like transparency around the entire GameStop episode could have been done in a much better way. Um, and I think that there is a pretty big opportunity for someone to build something like Robinhood, except build it in a trustless and verifiable way. I think that there will be a pretty big company that emerges from that in the next few years. Um, but so yeah, you don't think that the fintech front end, blockchain back end is the way? Or you don't think that the current like Revolut or Robinhood are the ones that are going to I think in the over? I think in the short term, they will have more activity happening on these centralized platforms. I think in the longer term, there will start to gradually be a shift where you start to see more and more trading activity happen in a decentralized way. I think the technology is just strictly better when you're doing things in a decentralized way. And there's a lot of issues around things like verifiability um, that you, I mean, just fundamentally get for free with the blockchain. Um, so yeah, I think in the future, we'll be moving in that direction. It's not going to be like a month from now, Robinhood will be displaced by some kind of decentralized exchange. Um, but I do think that it'll be like in some developing country, it'll be, that's where it starts taking off more. Like, and that's, that'll eventually lead to more and more um, of that transition happening over the next like 20 to 50 year time frame. Do you have any plan on helping Robin Hood in the future or working with them? Uh, I think our foundation team is in touch with them. So I can't really comment on anything around specifically Robin Hood. Um, I do think that we'd be more than happy to work with all um, kind of major fintech players because I think it ends up being a very beneficial thing for customers if there end up being verifiability and stuff happening on chain. You said before the Robin Hood story kind of made you bearish on two guys in the room, right? Making decisions. But you got into crypto before that. Mm. How did you get so fascinated by the world of cryptocurrencies? <laughs> yeah, that is quite the story. Um, so I initially got more exposed to crypto in a meaningful way back in 2017. Um, so at that time, I mean, I was uh, 2017, I was a junior in college at the time. Uh, my friends that were seniors, they were getting software engineering new grad offers from Facebook. So at the time, Facebook would give new grads 100K signing bonuses. This was basically 
literally is just like what it sounds like. So you sign a piece of paper and then they give you hundred K. Um, and my friends say some of them literally took that entire hundred K signing bonus and they just put that entirely into ether. So and this so is just one thing. Sorry, but like you do an internship for that or you just like get hired. And then if you say yes, mm -hmm. you get, okay, uh, welcome. Here's a hundred K. Yeah. And if I guess if you don't leave within I don't know a year or two or what's the kind of like yeah deal? so the specifics around that um, I think to get the hundred k signing bonus you needed to intern there and then qualify for return offer um, I think if you were just interviewing and you hadn't interned there before it was a less it was a lower signing bonus I think somewhere in like the fifty k range I don't remember the exact numbers in that scenario anymore but they were still pretty generous in terms of the signing bonus um, so just handing out money to people who just sign up and just. Yeah, and it was extremely <laughs> profitable for them to do that because if you have a company where the hiring bar, bar for a new grad is like, I mean, honestly, very high. Like these people, these new grads, they're like 22. They have like, their life is work and they tend to be extremely productive because they're already very qualified as like software engineers by the time, at least in terms of like being able to like crank out new features. Um, so from Facebook side, it's like a very, very strong investment, especially if that person stays for longer than a year and like they progress in the newity as well. So, yeah, I mean, you can't really fault Facebook for doing that. Like it was extremely successful for them to like give out these signing bonuses. Um, obviously new grads, like they see that signing bonus, they're like, shit, this is so much money. So like they ended up having a very high rate of accepting those offers as well. Um, I actually only think I had a couple of friends to like turn those offers down and they ended up becoming founders because they wanted to like build something that was like bigger or like be part of like a bigger thing um, than I guess they'd be able to at Facebook. So. Yeah, I mean, my friends, they invested that. <laughs> They're like, shit, 100K, let's just buy some ETH. <laughs> it, was in, Free money. it was an amazing decision for them to do that in hindsight. But I don't think I personally would have had like the balls to pull the trigger and like take that entire signing bonus and put it into a cryptocurrency back in 2017. Um, but yeah, I mean, these guys, they did that. And then afterwards, they started taking on like much more speculative bets. So I saw them like invest into other things. Eventually, I think they lost most of their money on Bitcoin Cash because like Bitcoin Cash, they like bought it before it was going to be trading on, uh, I think it was Coinbase back in 2017, 2018 timeframe. Um, and then they like halted trading for Bitcoin Cash. My friends had a limit sell for like 9K, halted at like 8.8K or something. And then afterwards it never recovered. Um, so yeah, I saw them write it up, write it down. And I think I learned a good number of lessons from that, just like watching it play out. Um, and yeah, that was like my original initial kind of foray into crypto. And then for more of the development side and like actually understand how the technology works, um, it was 2018. So at that time, my roommate, um, so I'd interned at Pinterest before then. And my, uh, roommate from Pinterest, he ended up like, he was master student at Stanford at the time. So he ended up starting his own blockchain company and he was going through Binance Labs. And that's when like, I got much more exposed to like smart contract development and like how blockchain works, consensus mechanisms, all that good stuff. You said you bought uh, ten thousand dollars of ETH in two thousand twenty in March. Yeah, you bought like pretty much the bottom. Like you told me, like a hundred and nine dollar or something like that. But you sold in May, sell in May and go away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for an eight k profit, which is eighty percent, right? Most people would be very happy with eight k uh, eighty percent profit in two months. But as we as we both know, you missed out on a nearly 50x on ETH right <laughs> after, right? What is what does this teach you about conviction? Yeah. So I think that's probably been my biggest investing mis uh, mistake. Thankfully, it hasn't been like huge losses. It's just been huge opportunity costs tied to uh, selling an asset before like it went up. But yeah, March of 2020, I made a 10K investment. And at that time I was like, okay, I believe in Ether. I believe in Bitcoin. So I'm going to be investing in Ether, which at that time seemed like that it had more upside. Mm -hmm. um, and it ended up growing much faster than I expected. Like in two months I was up, I, I think I got in at 109, sold it like 208 or something. So a little bit over 80%. And I was like, shit, this is like a good amount of cash. So I'm just going to like cash out because I don't know if it's going to have like that much more upside from there. Um, turns out it had a huge amount of upside. So I think, uh, several different lessons that I learned from that. Um, the first thing is like, I mean, first of all, you should cash out, but you shouldn't cash out everything. I think if anything, you should try to cash out whatever your initial investment is and do that slowly over like 
a much longer period of time, especially if it's something that you have con conviction in, rather than just trying to get out of it all at once. Um, the second thing is this idea of like winners win. It's like if something is going up a lot, then there are very good chances that like it's going to continue going up more. And I think in like traditional finance, like in stocks that like are part of the S&P 500, for example, I think this ends up being even more pronounced where you see, see that with stocks like NVIDIA, for example, where it's just like going in, like having these insane runs. Um, but there's generally something that is like justifying this kind of price action, um, especially for these like higher liquidity, higher market cap stocks. Um, so you should be quite thoughtful about like what it is that's like justifying this valuation. And if it's at the early part of like some kind of spike, then more likely that the not that spike is going to continue because there's like something really justifying that. So you should definitely hold on to those winners and like cut out your losers, basically. There's a sort of meme in crypto, which is a... Uh, I mean, let's take whatever, Solana. Mm -hmm. Solana at $100 is uh, cheaper than Solana at $20, right? And actually, we talked about that with uh, Daryl Wang, mm -hmm. who you know, right, from Tangent. Yeah. Uh, who is much more of a trader than Jason, right? And so I asked him exactly that. I was like, how do you know, how do you double down on a winner, right? How do you know when to cut losses and double down on a winner? And it's exactly that. It's a very counterintuitive concept for most people. They're thinking, oh, I see this chart is like wrecked. It's going to go back up, right? This one is already up. There's less upside, but actually, usually it's not what happens. What happens yeah. is people kind of double down on with their winners in crypto, but also in traditional investing, right? And uh, the ones that are dead, they are dead for a reason. Like <laughs> no one cares about them. Exactly, yeah. So it's all about attention. So absolutely. What are you the most convinced about today? Um, in terms of crypto, I think that one thing that is just like undeniable to me is that as at least an asset, I see it performing exceptionally well in the next five to 10 years. Like the overall market cap for just, I think crypto assets in general right now, it's like around two, two and a half trillion dollars. That's like less than one of the top like S&P 500 companies. Yeah. And that's like for all of crypto. And that's like, just if you look, if you compare that to a company, it's less than that. And then there's like all these other things that are like not even tied to stocks like bonds, for example. Um, so it is kind of a no brainer to me that as an asset, like a lot of these cryptocurrencies are going to do exceptionally well in the next five to 10 year window. Why? So I think there's like different things that are going to contribute to that. Um, one part of that is like just more adoption will start to happen. Um, in terms of like what that adoption specifically will be, I think that's a much more difficult question to answer. I think that there's like some things that are like, yeah, this is definitely what is like what blockchains are being used for, for example, payments, for example, trading of assets. Um, but I do anticipate there will be more use cases um, that emerge in the next five year window. So I think there'll just be more of that transition happening. I think there's also going to be more systemic things that push people towards using crypto. Um, one part of that I think will be using crypto as like a hedge against whatever your local currency is um, kind of failing. And I think that might not happen in, in the United States, but I do think in several other countries where the financial system is weaker, um, there will start to be more of a transition away from that failing financial system over to using um, cryptocurrencies. And more specifically, I think stable coins will end up being that like initial mechanism that like people will be using for um, like payments and value transfer. But I think that'll lead to people making use of blockchains more directly. And I think also as like a store of value, like people are going to start holding assets like Bitcoin um, in much greater quantities moving forward. Like once there starts to be ETFs, once there starts to be like just more institutional recognition and like more ease of access for institutions to get involved, I think there will be more capital inflows as well. So overall, I think that it's going to be definitely trending in a very positive direction for the financial side of these assets. Um, I think the big question ends up becoming like, okay, there's these things that I mentioned before, like payments, like trading that are like very clear use cases for crypto. Um, what is it that's going to like, what are the other things that like crypto is uniquely good for um, that'll enable more real world adoption of stuff happening on chain? Um, and I think that's like still one pretty big unanswered question at the moment. So in a nutshell, you think crypto is much higher in five to 10 years, right? The From a financial time. side, yeah, for sure. Why could you be wrong? I think regulation would be one of the most clear answers over there. Um, yeah, I mean, especially the United States, uh, I would say legal system, like however the US treats crypto, I think that'd be the most clear answer for like, if crypto were to become irrelevant five, 10 years from now, um, it would be because of US regulators. But even then, I think it's still, you'd need coordination between different 
um, different governments for that to really play out in practice. Why did you go all in into crypto and start a crypto protocol? I think there's multiple um, different reasons. Like one part of it is like definitely after going through everything that I saw with Robinhood, after seeing like my co-founder building a crypto or my uh, friend building a crypto company back in like 2018, um, I was very bullish on the idea that crypto had the potential to change the world. Um, I think that there's a ton of really interesting technical problems that emerge from building a blockchain as well, or from basically building any kind of decentralized distributed system. Um, and at that time, I mean, at that time, it was undoubtedly like the most exciting thing to be doing. I think even now, like even in the bear market, it's still extremely exciting to be in crypto. Like there's new stuff that happens like basically every week, every two weeks, there's like some pretty big kind of thing that happens. You say um, even now, even in the bear market? Even in the bear market. Yeah. Are you, men are you, are you saying that we're in a bear market now? I think that right now we, it's tough to like exactly say that like, yes, this is undoubtedly a bear market, but I think the sentiments right now are different than they were back in like December, or January. Like mm. back in January of this year, it was a very different kind of euphoria that people had. Um, I think right now it's in much more of a muted state. And compared to like November of 2021, it is completely different. Like November of 2021 was just totally different type of euphoria than we're seeing right Which now. Which is weird because the prices are almost similar for, for, for Bitcoin, a lot of, right? Yeah, yeah, for a lot of assets, the prices are similar. <laughs> but I think that people, I mean, as time progresses, people are expecting there to be more advancements. And when those advan advancements don't happen, then like, they become a little bit more pessimistic. I think also once like things are just going up, there's obviously more euphoria. Mm. When things have gone up and then come down a little bit, that results in more pessimism. So you launched Say Labs and yeah. the protocol was Say Protocol. What is Say Protocol? Yeah, so Say Protocol is a layer one blockchain. Um, we're building the first paralyzed EVM and it's currently live on mainnet right now. What is Say V2? Yeah. So when we got started with say, it's been like a huge kind of progression in terms of like what we've learned. Um, at the very start, we wanted to build a decentralized Robinhood. This was like at the mm. end of 2021, we're like, we saw this should go down with Robinhood. Let's build it in a decentralized way. Um, so we're like, let's more specifically build a central limit order book based exchange on chain. Um, so 2021, we like explored the options. We're like, none of these really make sense. Uh, so that's when we're like, okay, we'll just build an app chain instead. So initially we wanted to build something similar to like DYDX v4, if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. This was before DYDX v4 actually even announced. So I guess we didn't know that they were doing that. Um, but yeah, like we wanted to build an app chain. Then we kind of went through the entire learning process around that. And we realized that building an app chain is actually exceptionally difficult to get right. And it's very difficult to grow an ecosystem around that. So that's when we transitioned over from an app chain to being a completely general purpose chain. Um, and that's what Save V1 was. So Save V1 went live on mainnet in August of 2023. So over a year ago now. And it was the fastest chain in existence. It still is at the moment. Um, seeing 390 millisecond block times, which makes it like 10x faster than Solana and many other chains. Um, the biggest thing though, that was an issue for Save V1 is that there wasn't really much developer activity happening. And after chatting with a bunch of developers, we realized it's because we don't support the EVM. And that led us down that entire process of like, understanding like, okay, everyone used the EVM, these are the limitations, so this is what we're going to start to do. Um, and that's ultimately what led to us putting out a blog post for Save 2 This was November of 2023. And as soon as we put out that blog post, like we were like, okay, we're gonna start working on this, then we're gonna put out a governance proposal. Um, there was just extreme excitement around that. Like everyone was super, super excited to see the first paralyzed EVM come to life. And I feel like that's when like this entire vertical of like a paralyzed EVM really got minted. Before that, I, I don't think there was really from a public standpoint, like this perception of a paralyzed EVM being a vertical. Um, I think that's when that entire vertical got started. And I think that's when it became very clear to me that like 2024, there's going to be a ton of innovation happening um, tied to performance of blockchains. And I think at the moment, that is undoubtedly true. Like a lot of the biggest chains, a lot of the biggest infra projects that are like uh, pre-launch at the moment, they're all focused on higher performance, specifically through parallelization. And I think this trend will continue because at the end of the day, like no one wants slow chains. Like everyone wants to have cheap fees. Everyone wants to have fast infrastructure. So by default, I think in the next two year window, like everyone's going to be using a fast chain if they are able to do so. What is parallelization? Mm. Yeah. So parallelization is, I guess, maybe for more of an uh, ELI-5 explanation, like 
if you have, let's say that you're cooking something and there's three different things you want to cook. You want to make, um, what, what, what did you eat for lunch today? <laughs> you didn't? <laughs> That's the worst question. I had no breakfast, no lunch. <laughs> it's 7 p.m. I still haven't eaten anything. Damn. Okay. Usually it's not, uh, usually it's not the case, but today I, I couldn't because I told you I took this medicine yesterday, kind of mm. fucked my brain. And I was like, if I eat more, it's probably going to make me even more like tired. And I have this interview with, uh, <laughs> with Mike Novo. And then with you, I was like, fuck it. I'm just not going to eat it. So mm. I don't, I don't interfere with my brain more. Yeah. <laughs> but yesterday for lunch, I probably had this thing called sweet green, you know, sweet mm, green is sweet like, greens, this yeah. kind of like a healthy, Dude, I, I, I eat that all the time, lunch, greens. dinner, lunch all the time. Yeah. So let's say that you want to have a salad, right? So specifically you want to have um, chicken in that salad, which you're going to need to bake. There needs to be the vegetables that you need to uh, wash and then cut up as well. So one way that you could do it is you could first get the vegetables ready. So it might take you 10 minutes, like wash the vegetables and afterwards cut them up and then like put them aside. And then afterwards you start cooking the chicken and cooking the chicken. It might take you like, let's say 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And you do that after you're done cooking the vector cutting the vegetables. Now, the other way that you could do it is you could put the chicken into the oven at the same time that you start cutting the vegetables. And that way you're able to cut the vegetables while the chicken is cooking. So that's the core idea around parallelization, mm. which is that you can do two things at the same time. In this case, it would be like cutting the vegetables and cooking the chicken. You're doing those at the same time. Um, in the case of a blockchain, it's if I'm, if I'm a blockchain processing two transactions, like one from me to you, another from... Mike to Chow, you're mentioning, um, these two transactions are completely separate transactions. Like they're not touching each other at all. Like there's no overlapping state. Um, in that case, you're able to run them at the same time. Um, and that allows you to finish running them. Like transaction execution happens much, much faster. Um, and that's kind of the core breakthrough with parallelization. Like it lets you take the hardware you already have. Like most modern hardware right now has multiple cores. So it's able to process multiple work streams simultaneously. Um, so it lets you take that hardware to be able to get more out of your software and be able to process uh, more transactions per second. What is say protocol Holy Grail vision? Yeah, so our mission is to scale the EVM. Um, and I think moving forward, that's going to end up being like, we just want to be the default place where people do any kind of on-chain activity. Mm. Um, I think that's a very lofty vision. And I think there's several other projects right now that are doing a pretty good job um, at supporting that. But I, I fundamentally example? think, I think Solana is like probably one of the most clear protocols right now that um, is doing something like that. I, I don't think Ethereum L1 can really handle the kind of scale that we'll need in the future. And I think Solana is probably the closest example to a chain that mm -hmm. is trending in the right direction. But with that being said, like Solana doesn't support the EVM and uh, it doesn't natively support the EVM. Um, and I think in order to really grow any kind of infrastructure project, like you need there to be a ton of killer applications. Killer applications will come from a lot of developers that start building there. And developers typically only go with the EVM right now. And that's why I think that it's exceptionally difficult to grow, let's say Solana. Or, I think Solana has a bigger shot over here of like becoming bigger in the future. But if, if you look at like any of the move based chains, for example, I think it's going to be exceptionally difficult for them to get market share against chains like Ethereum. How do you think like, how do you think that Solana managed to become so big without uh, having this native, um, support of the EVM. Yeah, I think, I mean, FTX made it like a very different scenario. Like the support from FTX is something that you don't really see with any other chain. So I think that was like a very special case that like allowed them to become a lot a lot bigger. I think they were also one of the first chains to market that had this like super high performance that was able to like, if you have this high performance, if you have this good tech, and then people come and start building on it because of maybe FTX support, and then there end up being some killer applications that get built, it suddenly makes it much more likely for new developers to come in and want to start building on your chain. Because fundamentally, like developers want to win and winning to them can mean different things. For some, they want to make as much money as they can. For others, it's just like getting the most number of users. But if you're in an ecosystem that has the most users, the most TVL, the most liquidity, um, it's a no brainer for developers to start going over there versus trying to get developers to start building in some kind of pre-launch ecosystem that's using a different virtual machine. So yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think all of that is to say that there is an aspect of winners win with blockchains. And I think the EVM right now is like, it has won so far. And that's why it's a no brainer to continue using the EVM and improving on that versus trying to create an entirely new virtual machine. As the following question to Kironi from Monad, mm -hmm. 
and um, to Adeni from Sui. So let me ask you the same question. Do we really need another layer one? Oh, 100%. Why? So I think that if you look at the existing landscape of, especially like Ethereum is where most of the activity is happening. If Ethereum is not able to scale, um, then like you want that to be happening on some other type of infrastructure. Uh, if your goal is to have top end performance, then you basically need to be making use of a layer one. Um, if you have a modular chain where there's like a separate execution layer, a separate uh, settlement layer, a separate DA layer, it introduces much more complexity into the overall system. And if there's like any kind of issue that happens, let's say that there's a bug in the settlement layer and then settlement layer has an issue, then like it introduces a lot more failure scenarios you need to be handling at, let's say in this case, the execution layer. So if there's any innovation that happens with the modular stack, you can combine all of the different parts of that modular stack into just one monolithic chain. And that one monolithic chain will be able to have better performance, less sources of complexity, um, because it's all the same actors that are going to be controlling it. Um, so I think that that's going to give you the best top end performance that you would uh, that you would want. There is a part in this podcast where I ask um, the guests their top two or three favorite crypto teams. Obviously, I'm not talking about prices and token recommendation. Mm -hmm. Teams can have no token; doesn't matter. It's more why. What are your favorite teams and why do you like them so much? Mm. So, yeah, I mean, kind of in line with what I was saying before, I would say one of the teams for sure is Solana. Mm. And I think that's not necessarily a super contrarian answer by any means at this point. But I think being one of the first teams to really say that, okay, we're going to focus more on performance via parallelization instead of trying to take the approaches around like consensus or many of the other approaches that are taken being that are being taken back in the day. Um, I think that is extremely respectable. And like the approach that they've taken, I think has been just incredible. Like they've been crushing it. Um, so I re really respect Toli. I really respect the way that their team has approached the problem. Um, so I'll, I'll go with Solana. Is there another one? Uh, there's no other team that I guess like instantly comes to mind. Mm. Um, but yeah, I feel like overall there's a ton of projects that are like overall doing pretty cool things. Are you also an in, so the, the, we talked about the 10,000 bucks you bought in ETH, right? Mm -hmm. Are you also an investor in the space? Like or a private investor or like a- I would say more liquid. Private, I would say probably, right? Yeah, yeah. I have some private deals that I've done. Um, I try to avoid putting too much liquid money into crypto, but I do have, I, I think right now my biggest positions are tied to, um, one of them is actually Athena. Mm. Um, so I'm still getting, I think now the yield has dropped quite a bit, so I might want to reconsider that. But I think back in the day, the yield was much higher than like 5%. Um, so you yeah. have your cash? Yeah, yeah. Cash on uh, Athena? A little bit of cash in Athena. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Ether, Sol would be the other two big assets that I'm holding right now. No Bitcoin? No, I never got back into Bitcoin. Like 2020, I had, before buying Ether, I'd actually bought some Bitcoin and then I got out of that. Um, and then afterwards... I haven't gotten back into Bitcoin, but maybe that'll be something I do in the future. I, I also feel like as a founder in crypto, like you're already pretty tied to <laughs> the crypto space and not just the actual like financial side of it, but also all your time is being invested into that. So it's probably a good thing to start diversifying as much as you can. Where do you diversify? I mean, it'll just be stock markets for the most part, like S&P 500. And like, I actually went through this at Robinhood where I was like, okay, I want to learn how to like start starting to invest better. Yeah. Um, initially, I started like trading options because that's what everyone at Robinhood <laughs> was doing. Turns out that's nice a- Nice start. It's yeah. the same as the leveraging, <laughs> leverage crypto shit coins uh, on Binance, yeah. right? That's how yeah. you start crypto. I think you can lose your money faster in many cases with, um, well, it depends on how much leverage you're taking. But with options, like if you buy a zero day expiration options, like by the end of the day, you could just lose all your money. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like I remember like, <laughs> I bought like one, this is right after I started, started working full time and Robin did not give me any kind of fat signing bonus. It's so like, I, I bought like a $5,000 Amazon call. So that was like a lot of money for me back in the day. Um, I guess it still kind of is. And I was, I saw it went, go up from like $5,000 to like $20,000. So I'm like, holy shit, like this is insane. And then afterwards it went down to zero. I'm like, oh shit, that was like pretty fucking stupid. <laughs> um, but yeah, like after going through that, I was like, okay, I want to start like learning how to like actually invest from the fundamentals. And that's when I like read a book uh, called A Random Walk Down Wall Street. The best one. The best I one. I read three or four books. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is Burton Malkiel, right? I don't Burton remember. Malkiel, I yeah. believe so, yeah. So Little Common Sense of Investing. I had uh, I read uh, at the same time, uh, Unshakable, Tony Robbins, Money mm -hmm. Master the Game. Mm -hmm. 
And then this one, mm. this one is like amazing yeah. because it's a mix of theory from a professor and practice, right? Yeah, exactly. And I th think, I mean, my core takeaway from that was like, okay, you don't really, you shouldn't necessarily even try to beat the market unless you really, really know what you're doing. Like in the long term, the market will beat you unless you're like Renaissance or whatever, like unless you're like a fucking God. So it's better to just be diversifying as much as you can. And that's the kind of overall mantra that I've been taking, like just diversify or like hold like really high market cap kind of stocks that are like already fairly reflective of the market. I think he's saying, I think the takeaway of this book is a monkey throwing random darts yeah. is going to do better than you, right? As top, as top oh, picking, right? Do better than me and do better than like most yeah. people on Wall yeah. Street as well yeah. that are actually <laughs> managing. Yeah. And that's why like after reading that, I became really confused about technical analysis. Because even in crypto, it seems like there's a lot of people that are like preaching technical analysis and like after just reading that, I'm like, this seems like it's not going to be working. Um, and I guess that's why most people that like do TA, they don't necessarily make um, long-term returns from that. They make money on the courses that they sell. Exactly, yeah. That's, that's it. Yeah. I mean, I found that technical analysis can be really helpful to enter into a position mm -hmm. in a bear market, right? Oh, mm -hmm. is there confirmation, et cetera? Like, so it's kind of like a mix between fundamental and technical. Mm -hmm. But like the influencers or KOLs, whatever you want to call them, right? They make money on the courses that they sell and they need to have content, right? Every day. And the, exactly. the, the TA is great because every day I can chart some, some and stuff. It also makes you feel like you're doing something. Like if you're just passively investing, it's like, you don't feel like you're doing anything. And like, your mind is always like, what, what could I be doing with, with this time? And TA like really makes you feel like you're doing something to make money. I mean, That's for most even, people you lose money, but yeah. The difference between between uh, trading and investing or between gambling and investing, right? Yeah. Investing, I think in those books that we mentioned before, they just say uh, investing should be like uh, watching paint dry. <laughs> it's boring as fuck, right? Yeah. Like, but that's, how, that's what works. So you buy an S&P 500 or NASDAQ. Actually, that's an interesting conversation to challenge you a bit uh, that I had with Raul Pao mm -hmm. for two hours and a half on the podcast. And his, his entire framework is S&P 500 doesn't beat the 12% hurdle rate, right? Hurdle rate, 12% mm -hmm. is basically seven or 8% uh, money printing plus 4% inflation. Mm -hmm. If you want to outperform the hurdle rate, mm -hmm. you need to do at least 12%. 12% is S&P 500. If you invest in S&P 500, you're not, you're not making any money. Mm -hmm. So you're basically mm -hmm. flat, since 2009, <laughs> uh, bottom, mm -hmm. uh, it's up 650%. I think S&P 500, but you're basically flat mm -hmm. because you don't beat the hurdle rate. Next one is NASDAQ. The only ones that, that outperform the hurdle rate is NASDAQ and Bitcoin or NASDAQ mm -hmm. and crypto. Mm -hmm. NASDAQ is 17% annualized. So basically you're outperforming by 5% mm -hmm. and Bitcoin, 140% annualized. Yeah. And therefore his entire framework is you should have most of your money or your liquid ne network, which he, he has. In Bitcoin, and then you can go down the rabbit, uh, the the risk curve. Yeah, Bitcoin, ETH, Sol, etc. Right. So that's an interesting point, actually. Yeah. The, does it make sense? I'm thinking about the same. What at the end of the bull run? I mean, or in the middle, or whatever. Whenever you take profit, what do you take profit into? Mm -hmm. I personally would not be taking all of my profits and putting into something that's extremely volatile. And I personally think of Bitcoin as being more volatile than like I can stomach for like a larger portion of my portfolio. Mm -hmm. Um. I think that's probably true for like NASDAQ as well. Like, I also think there's a pretty high correlation between NASDAQ and like crypto assets. I think that it is much more focused on tech than the S&P 500. Although to be fair, I think the S&P 500 also is pretty strong correlation at this point with um, mm. crypto assets. But yeah, overall, I'd want to be putting it into something that I view as much safer. Um, but it really depends on like what the investment goals are for that particular person. Like, I could definitely see a world in which you view Bitcoin as like, the stable amount that like, like you're comfortable with that volatility mm -hmm. and you would just invest all of it into Bitcoin in that case. Do you use Robinhood to buy your S&P 500 every day or week or month? Yeah, I have. In the past, I have set up recurring trades on Robinhood and it's actually incredibly convenient to not need to go and like buy it every single day manually. So you have the, these rules. On the financial side, there is some rules you have on other aspects of your life, health and food. Mm, yeah. Which we talk about kind of like the 2080 rule, right? You spend quite a bit of time optimizing your health and food. How? 
Yeah. In general, I think that for many things in life, um, if you just spend 20% of the time, you're going to get 80% of whatever that ROI is or whatever the value it is from doing that thing. Um, specifically, I think one thing that applies to everyone is going to be things tied to sleep, things tied to nutrition, things tied to exercise. Like every single person is going to have some aspect of this in their lives. Um, when it comes to sleep, I read the book, Why We Sleep, which I think is like a pretty common book that people are like mentioning on um, like self-improvement videos. Um, and that was really interesting because I hadn't really thought about sleep from like a scientific scientific perspective before then. Like back when I was in like high school and college, I had extremely bad sleep habits. Like I'd basically go to sleep at 2 a.m., wake up at like 7 a.m. And like, I just like power through the rest of the day. Um, turns out that was like really bad for me. And in hindsight, like I noticed like the difference between how I feel nowadays when I'm getting like seven hours of sleep versus when I was getting five hours of sleep. So why do we sleep? Well, I mean, we sleep for, from the body standpoint, I think it's to help with like recovery. Um, and this would be like muscle recovery, like removing like, I guess, gunk. I forget the exact terminology, but like improving your brain function, solidifying memories. Um, so overall, I, I would say that it helps with a variety of different things. Um, in my case, I've noticed that it helps a lot with like my mood and my mental functioning. So like from a very practical standpoint, it's like undeniable that like I'm just sharper when I sleep well. Um, so I think from like the founder perspective, it's like much better to be trying to get at least seven hours of sleep. I try to target like seven to eight hours of sleep. Um, one thing that I found to be helpful is like actually using a sleeping app to track how much I'm moving as well. Um, like with your watch, it's able to like track whatever movements you have. And from there you're able to like, even if you spend like seven hours in bed, you might only be sleeping for like five and a half hours. So it's like good to give yourself more time in that case. Um, so how I found well that- How well are you doing at that? I would say that getting seven hours of sleep has actually been much easier to do now. Um, back when I was, back in like the earlier days of say, it was a lot harder to do that because we'd have like late night calls and then afterwards early morning meetings as well. Um, I think now we're able to get into a much better kind of cycle around that where like we're able to work from like more traditional hours. Um, it might go into the evening, but it doesn't require like sacrificing sleep. So I think that's been one thing that has been just fantastic for my overall quality of life. Uh, the second thing I would say tied to exercise, I personally ended up getting like much more into exercise than I think beyond like the baseline. But I think just from purely the baseline, there's like a minimum number of days they recommend like doing cardio, minimum number of weightlifting sessions. And if you just do that, I think it's like really, really good for you. What's the minimum? Uh, for cardio, I think it's, they recommend doing like two to three days of cardio and like two to three uh, weightlifting sessions a week. Um, what does that represent cardio 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. I think the exact numbers are like 150 minutes of like stuff like walking each week or okay. 75 minutes of like vigorous exercise. So this would be, they consider like jogging to be vigorous exercise. Um, so it's not like going super hard. It's like just being like zone two, zone three kind of workouts. Um, so in my case, I ended up actually just getting really into running. Like in my case, I was like, I want to improve my health. So I started running. Running ended up being really difficult for me. Like, I don't think for me personally, like my genetic predisposition and like my body type was like ideal for running at all. It was just really fucking hard. And that's actually kind of what made it enjoyable um, because it was like kind of every single time I did it, it felt very satisfying versus like when I went weightlifting, it just felt like something that I did versus something that like made me feel like I was doing something like super meaningful. Um, so yeah, running was hard and- What was satisfying? Is it seeing the progress every time or is it like, actually, you don't want to, but I went, uh, oh, I feel great now. I think initially it was just not wanting to do it and then doing it anyway. Like if you're able to consistently do that, yeah. I think you're able to like kind of get control over your life in a way. So that was like, I mean, this was also after my dad passed away. So I was like, okay, I want to get control over my life. And I think that really helped out from that perspective. Um, then once you're consistent in anything, you start seeing like improvements and you're like, oh shit. Like my 5k time went from like 29 minutes down to like 26 minutes in the course of like a couple months. Like I should try becoming even better at this. Um, and then from there it just became like this gradual progression where it's like, okay, I'm consistent now. Like how do I optimize this even further? Like, okay, that's when you like read the literature. It's like, okay, there's like different types of workouts, like interval workouts, threshold workouts, like long runs, easy runs, like all, all that stuff. And then from there you can start like going down even deeper into that rabbit hole. So I think that's like, um, been pretty fun to dive deeper into. What are you looking for exactly now when you're going for a run? Um, so I tend to be a very numeric person. I just want to get to like a certain 5K time. And then I want to get to like certain weightlifting goals and kind of just like 
that, that's what I'm aiming for right now. I, I don't know what I'll do after that. I might just like kind of plateau over there because I view that as like healthy enough. Or it might be like trying to continue optimizing by like trying out different events or something. Um, but yeah, I, I think right now it's just going to be like a certain 5K time and then certain like squat, deadlift, and uh, bench pressing goals. You said uh, going for a run is not enjoyable, right? Especially for you. At least it was not in the beginning. Yeah. There's another thing that's not enjoyable in the beginning. Starting a company. <laughs> What's oh. the parallel between running and starting a company? I actually think at the start is kind of a honeymoon phase with the company. Mm. So I think it's actually completely different in that sense because when you have like an idea, it's like, you're kind of like, holy shit, I'm a genius. Like this is going to change the world. <laughs> um, so the initial part of it is like really easy to have enthusiasm and like excitement for. Um, but continuing that going, I think like the first few months, like honestly, even the first six months is easy. But it's after that when it starts to become more of like, I wouldn't say a slog, but it's like more like a job where you have to continue showing up. And like that consistency, I think is one of the things that differentiates like people that do really well versus people that like just give up at like before they even really have a chance to succeed. And I think most founders, like they give up way too early in a way. Like if there's like co-founder drama, or whatever, like sure, that's like reasonable. But a lot of times they just don't have PMF and they're like, okay, I'm going to give up now. And I, I don't think that's the right way of approaching it. Like if things aren't going well, you should just continue being relentless, like continue changing the approach that you're taking. And as long as you're putting yourself out there, I think there's a good chance that you will get lucky in some ways and whatever you're doing will work out. Absolutely. I mean, easier said than done. Huh? But if I you suppose. never stop, yeah. at some point, luck should find you or you should find luck at some point. I mean, provided you're not too stubborn and you're like very receptive of feedback and everything, right? Yeah. Like I have some friends that like, after graduating from college, they spent like five to seven years working on the same idea. And I think after a certain point, you need to be willing to like change your direction. Mm. I think ideally having like tight feedback loops is like critical in terms of finding product market fit. Um, but I do think that like luck is probably the most important thing for a startup to succeed. And good founders, they're not people that are like 100% guaranteed to succeed. I, I think they put themselves out there. They have like something that could work and then a lot of conditions align and then things are able to take off at that time. And these like super big companies, I think they have multiple events like this, but if you're not putting yourself out there, there's like no way in which you're going to end up getting lucky. What's your definition of luck? So um, I think in like Say's case, for example, like there was Say went live with V1. There was pretty clear market feedback that like uh, developers did not want to build on V1. We took that feedback. We're like, okay, what is it the developers want? We'll put out this V2 announcement. And once we put out the V2 announcement, there was suddenly a lot of excitement around Say. And then we went live. We're like the first parallel EVM to go live. There's been more opportunities from luck based off of that. Like right now, there's like some pretty big name projects that are going to be launching on Say. And I think that because we're the first one to be live, like we're able to benefit from these lucky coincidences where like they got involved in the ecosystem early and now they're going to be launching like pretty significant things. So I think in our case, it's just been like continuing to put things out there, um, whether that's like putting out things that we want to be building or putting out like actually shipping things. Um, and then a lot of times like that might not matter, but sometimes it does result in like a ton of excitement and a ton of um, traction just tied to that. Everyone can step outside of their home and go for a run. They should. Should they? Do you think everyone can start a company if starting mm. a company and going for a run is similar? So I think everyone, if they believe in themselves, they should try. I think there's probably certain personality traits that I would be skeptical of. But one thing that I've learned is that it's close to impossible to judge whether someone's going to succeed. Um, and I think that... Yeah, I mean, I think in our case as well, like most VCs turned us down when we're getting started. So like by the canonical definition, like we were not someone that we were not people that were on track to like make it or whatever. Um, but I think still, I still think things worked out like pretty well for us because we believed in ourselves. I, I don't think if other people, like I, I don't think other people's belief of you should really matter in that equation. It's more like, do you think that you believe in yourself? That's so interesting because there is, but a few people would say there is a kind of playbook to go and raise money. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of playbook to build a company. I've heard also, and I believe the same, right? I used to be, 
my first company I built when I was 23. So I used to be more cocky and think there's one way to do things. And if someone comes in with an idea and I think it's not a good idea, mm-hmm. I'm going to think like, there's no chance I should tell them, right? What I learned with time is I have no fucking clue. <laughs> how, how, they, how could I even like, how dare I give you a feedback? I had this feedback from a friend lately. Uh, he, he's building a new company and he was like, yeah, Kevin, I'm really disappointed because all of my friends, other friends, they came with, an, uh, with advices and everything and you don't say anything. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, listen, I'm not saying nothing because I don't have time. I don't care. It's just because if it's your idea, right? First idea is worth nothing. Execution is worth everything. How could I be so entitled or feel like I'm so different or amazing that I could tell you that this is going to work or not? I think you should just go for it, right? Yeah. You should go for it. Like the only advice I can give you or you're looking for feedback is go for it and you'll figure out and you might just be able, like I might have done some things not well. I might have done some things well, but it's because it's the thing that I felt was the right thing to do. You might have the same feeling in something that I have no idea about. We talk about that with uh, Jason Choi, mm. uh, d- uh, Dunning-Kruger effect. Mm, yeah. <laughs> right? Like how can you think that you are knowledgeable in one space because you're doing well, but then think that you're, therefore you're good in other fields or area you don't yeah so if you come to me with an idea that might sound crazy or stupid to me but i don't even know the industry or the space or the the, i I don't have your experience of trying to solve this problem that you experience right yeah so i can't tell you if it's good or not the only thing i can tell you is go for it and see yeah right yeah no i i definitely agree with that like i when i'm giving feedback to my friends i try to give them feedback but also be like very open-minded to that and make it very clear to them that like it's very difficult for anyone to really be a judge on whether something's going to succeed until they actually try it. Yeah. Um, I also think that a lot of the people that try to have like this pattern recognition, they end up being investors that are trying to like apply this pattern recognition to make investments. Um, I think most investors in crypto are like pretty bad, honestly. Like a lot of them have been able to have good returns because they've just gotten in early. And like the overall like beta for crypto investments mm-hmm. have been pretty good in the past like five, seven years. Um, but in general, I think like most VC investors, they don't, like they are pretty poor judges. Most of their investments do not work out. And based off that, I think that if VCs say no to you, that's not a reason for you to be discouraged. Um, If you believe in yourself and like you're willing to take feedback and like keep iterating, like you still need to be good. Like there's no doubt about that. But I think that VC saying no doesn't really mean very much. What's a good uh, investor? I think that in our case, um, we got pretty fortunate that like Multicoin ended up leading our seed round. I think they've been, I mean, they have a stellar reputation, like, I guess, being the main uh, VC firm behind Solana. So they have a ton of experience, like, supporting teams like ours. So I think they've been great. Um, Yeah, Jason from Tangent, uh, Jason and the entire Tangent team, they've been fantastic as well. So I would say that they've both been very helpful from the very beginning. What characterizes a good investor? Yeah, so I think that, first of all, being um, involved, like, there's a lot of investors that are, like, pretty hands off. And I think that being hands off is like, it makes you kind of a five out of 10 investor. I think the worst investors are the ones that are trying to be hands on, but then they end up kind of interfering. So between being like hands off versus actively like being negative, I think it's better to be hands off. Um, But I think the ones that are like hands on and are offering very valuable feedback, making strong introductions, like just helping you from like the different parts of the company that you need help on at any given time. Uh, so this could be tied to recruiting, like introducing you to potentially good hires. Uh, this could be tied to like the sales cycle, like introducing you to good founders that might be like building on top of your product. Um, or it could even be like strategy advice, like, okay, this is how you should think about your position in the market. Um, these kinds of things end up being extremely helpful. And I think VCs are like uniquely good at a lot of these things because they both have a big network in crypto or just in whatever industry they're in. So they're able to make a lot of good introductions. Um, and they've also just been able to see like, get access to like a ton of different founders and like the way that they've approached the problem. So they have a much larger data set to base their feedback off of versus if one individual founder might have a much smaller data set, which is their own experience. You have a girlfriend? I do, yeah. In crypto, there is a joke that now that Vitalik Buterin <clears throat> has a girlfriend, it's actually bearish for ease. You don't yeah. agree with that. Why? Yeah, I think that's honestly pretty... I, I think in Ethereum's case, they're looking for something to 
pin the blame on in a way. <laughs> I also think lar it's largely just a joke. Like people are memeing about it. Mm -hmm. um, I actually think that I maybe this is a hot take, but I think investing in founders that are in stable, committed relationships is like that should become maybe not the norm, but I think that's like a positive green flag that you could see with people. Like if someone's able to maintain a stable relationship, then that's probably indicative of them as a person being someone that's like um, able to be good in like some types of like interpersonal situations. And I think that as a founder, like you're going to have to be working with your co-founders. You're going to be after working with investors, like several different people. And that will be like, yeah, if you're good at people skills in one aspect, I think that can potentially translate over in other aspects as well. Should investors and VC look at the relationship status of a founder as a I, key factor? I am sure some of them have considered that. I'd be very curious what the kind of outcomes around that are. Um, another one that I've also thought about is like just people that are like exercising and like consistent with things. Um, my hunch is that if someone is like consistent with exercising, like, I mean, it's kind of like people that are like athletes in college, like they end up being just really intense and like very like driven for whatever they want to do. Um, so I think those people end up making very good employees, very good founders. And I think it's going to be the same with like exercising as well. Absolutely. But yeah, I'm curious if they've ever done studies around that, like the founders that are like exercising every day, whether they outperform founders that are... The main question is probably like the, these people who make these investment decisions, they probably, to include that in their own... Um, process of investment, they probably need to also walk the talk, right? <laughs> hey. That's true. That's true. <laughs> like, am I fit? Do I have good relationships or like, yeah. do I just expect that from other people, but I'm not walking the talk, right? Yeah. And I mean, there's always pretty big counter examples for all of these things. Like, I mean, Elon Musk, for example, I guess he's notorious for having like trouble with his relationships. So maybe that might not be the best signal. Like you can still be a very successful entrepreneur without necessarily being in long-term stable relationships yeah. uh, for a long time. Yeah, you could say that uh, geniuses have pretty twisted minds and therefore it makes it very easy, very hard for them to, to be in relationships, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like the whole founder mode um, discussion that's been happening where like some people are perceiving founder mode to be someone that's like just very um, kind of in the weeds, but also like overly nitpicky around things that are happening, like very micromanagey. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that a lot of times the founders that end up doing very well, they might actually have those personality traits that might make them less easy to be around. Um, but those end up being things that are actually good for the success of a business because they're just very obsessed with it. So David is in the details, right? Exactly, yeah. That's very controversial, but it's actually very, it makes so much sense, right? Yeah. Because the small details compound over time. So like if the more you are, I don't want to say perfect, but like near perfection, like the more... Yeah. But on the flip side, I mean, I'm reading the book called The Founders, which mm -hmm. is about the PayPal mafia. And Elon Musk, for example, like at least based off the depiction that the founders had, it seems like he wasn't necessarily, he was very involved, but he was making a ton of bad decisions, which was eventually what led to basically everyone colluding to like oust him as a CEO back in like whatever, 2000, 2001. Um, so I do think that more likely than not, like being a good founder means being active and present but you should still rely on the feedback that other people are giving versus assuming that like, you know, everything and like dictating things based off that. What's a bad decision? Uh, in the case of, let's say PayPal, for example, um, I think the two pretty negative decisions that got Elon ousted, according to the book, at least, um, first of all, was like tied to the technology. Like he was basically telling people to make use of a certain, certain tech stack that they didn't believe in. This led to a ton of issues. And he was basically, he became this single person who was like, in a way responsible for these issues. Like he went against Max Levchin and like a lot of the engineering team at the time. And yeah, like he single-handedly was in a way responsible for that. Um, another thing is like just being very stubborn on things that are in a way to a degree like inconsequential. Like in his case, he was very stubborn about like the x.com naming at the time instead of like he wanted to use x.com instead of PayPal. So I think there's a lot of these things which is going to be affecting people's perception of you. Um, and if you're not getting by and that's going to be just very negative. Do you think this is being wrong or making bad decisions or being misunderstood because uh, arguably if you look at Elon Musk's success afterwards he just kind of went against the odds multiple times and was very successful at it so maybe the people around him just didn't understand him I think in the case of PayPal based off my understanding it seems like he was wrong in that case 
it also seems like he took that as an opportunity to learn how to improve. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very possible that like he did not, like it was actually just poor decisions at PayPal, but that led to him improving and like making better decisions in the future. Because I do think when you go through these traumatic experiences, like being on your honeymoon and then being ousted by the board and then having to frantically fly back, like shit like that hardens you as a person. And it makes you really think about like how you've been approaching life. And I think it is possible to change yourself based off that. Do you want to get married and have kids? I do, yeah. Why? I think that, um, I mean, one part of it is just societal. Like, this is what I've been accustomed to be believing. Um, I actually don't know how significant the idea of a marriage is, but I think in terms of having kids, I definitely mm -hmm. would want to have kids in the future. Um, yeah, I just feel like it would be, like, I don't know, there's just like something very primal about wanting to have kids and then helping them like be the best versions of themselves that they can be. Um, that sounds like something that I would enjoy. You said, I'm not sure about marriage itself, right? Why? It's entirely a societal construct. And I do think that I would probably still get married just because of like my upbringing. But I do think it's one of those things that doesn't really matter like It's more just like a title versus something that's like more fundamental and innate to humans. Probably matters much more to a woman, especially based on her, I'm saying like the, the, the celebration and like the mm -hmm. kind of like dream day of being the, having that one day, right? That's true. It's like a dream of the probably most women out there. Yeah, it's like, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I do think that that is like one of the peak life milestones that like everyone, I mean, I think little girls especially like dream about. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it probably matters more for, for girls than guys. What's something you believe in that most people would not agree with? Uh, there's been a ton of debates I've gotten into on crypto Twitter. Um, yeah, I can't think of something. I could just give you a crypto Twitter example if that's, if that's good. Go ahead. Um, yeah, one thing that's been extremely controversial that I put out a few months ago Uh, was basically this idea that we don't um, we don't need to have very large validator sets. The direction the industry is going in is to have much smaller validator sets that are like maybe 50, 100 nodes. Um, and that'll be like where we end up on in the future. Can you and explain that for normal people? Like what does that mean and why is it important or not important? Yeah. So the idea of a blockchain is to be a decentralized um I guess a distributed ledger, so like a decentralized entity where like a lot of different people can partake in that. The way that most blockchains like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana have approached this is by making it possible for anyone to get involved as either a validator or a miner. Um, so they have like thousands, tens of thousands of different people that are like just free running transactions for every single block that comes in. Um, this is the kind of default mode that most blockchains had taken in the OG days. Uh, what started becoming, starting to become a lot more common now is either having centralized sequencers, which is what a lot of rollups are doing, which is basically just like one node that is determining the ordering of transactions. Um, or what you see with most modern L1s, which is having a smaller validator set of, let's say, less than 200 nodes. Um, and with the smaller validator set, you're able to get much better performance. Um, and it's also much more sustainable to run the network. Because if you have like 10,000 different uh, validators that are all re-executing the same transactions, like Let's say a block comes in, it has 100 different transactions. There's 10,000 validators. They all need to rerun those transactions. And that's just extremely redundant. Like they're all rerunning the same shit. And that's, that's extremely bad because people only run validators if there's enough money that they're making from emissions from the network. So it basically becomes a cost on the network. If there's 10,000 people, that suddenly becomes like hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars that you need to be as a blockchain paying these people to run their hardware. Now, if you have a smaller validator set, then it's cheaper to run that because there's less nodes. And it's also possible for these nodes to be higher hardware, like have higher hardware requirements, so they're able to get better performance overall. So that's why I think that's the direction the entire industry is moving towards. I think it's controversial because that goes against a lot of things that Ethereum, Solana, Bitcoin community believe in. But I think that is the, there's very clearly writing on the wall and that's the direction that all of us are going in. Because it's more practical. Much more practical. You get much better performance. It's much cheaper. So I think the entire industry will start adopting that in the future. What's your biggest prediction for the next 12 months? So, yeah, in terms of infrastructure for blockchains, I think that it is 
kind of inevitable that everyone is going to start moving towards higher performance blockchains. Like if you can choose between getting 10,000 transactions per second on chain versus 50 transactions per second, it's a no brainer to go with a chain that offers uh, 10,000 TPS, um, which is why I think over the next 12 months, you're going to start seeing more and more clients being made, more and more execution clients that support higher performance. Um, one of them is Say, and I think in the future there'll be others as well. And the entire industry will start migrating more and more towards these higher performance um, infrastructures. What happens to the uh, legacy ones? I think that people transition away from those. So those legacy execution environments will become less common. So like a vanilla EVM, I think will become less common than using a high performance like paralyzed EVM. And I think the projects that are not willing to adapt to that, they will start having less traction, like less activity and um, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that they will die out, but I think that they will start just becoming less and less relevant. You said you hold ETH and SOL, right? Mm -hmm. Why do you hold ETH if you think that way? So I think that ETH has, it, it is where all the activity in a way is happening right now. Like that's where there is the most TVL, the most number of users. And even if things don't happen on Ethereum L1, if they're able to go in the direction of having a roll-up centric roadmap, then in theory, they will be happening on a level above that where they're using Ethereum for settlement. Um, maybe they'll be using Ethereum for data availability in the longer term as well. Um, so I think there will be some amount of value that goes back to the base layer. Thank you so much for doing this, Jay. That was Perfect. a great conversation. Thank you, man. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs>